Okay, so Bob, perhaps you can just tell me who you are. Yeah. Right, well, my name is Bob, uh, family name is Bob, and I was christened Robert Lear Hoslett, and um, I was born in Birmingham, I hate to say it, but uh, in March 1930. Right, and what brought you to the Harwell area? Well, um, a long story really, it, it, it follows my education in Bristol, Kingsley Grammar School, and then my elect, I elected to, to um, go into military service, as everybody had to do, before I went to un university, um, as there was a, a extreme pressure on, on, on places at that time. And after being in the RAF for nine months, I was then deleted out, having caught scarlet fever and rheumatic fever, and I was, I was, I was at home and, and had to do something. And at that time, there were adverts in the paper, I think, which my father picked up for jobs at Harwell, and that's how I came to Harwell, of course. Right. That's how I heard of Harwell, and I came to Harwell in 1950 for my first interview. So what, what, did you, what role did you take on when you came to Harwell? Uh, not, not, nothing to boast about, I can assure you. It was, I was a, taken on as a scientific assistant, which was the lowest scientific grades that you could get that place. Below that I had been a general worker and I wasn't, wasn't that. Right. Uh, and let's just run through your career at Harwell and how things developed on that side. Uh, well, um, I hadn't been there long before I was promoted from, the, from the, this grade that I got. I must have had a bad interview on the day I was interviewed at Harwell. Um, I moved on to assistant experimental officer and then later to experimental officer and uh, well I'd, I'd need to um, glance at my paper to tell me the dates of where I, actually the things happened but it all happened between about 1950 and, and 1960 and the, my first job at, at Harvard, remembering this was the golden age of isotopes isotopes were going to be the, the, the panacea for, for everything in the world, for medicine, diagnosis and treatment, for in industry, for, for many applications, including radiography. And all these isotopes had to be made in, in, by putting samples in a reactor, and they stay in the reactor for a period of time, they come out, they were activated, and, and then they were ready for use for whatever application it, it was. Well, my, my initial job was to weigh out the materials, dispense the materials that were going to be put in the reactor, calculate how long they should stay in the reactor, and then when they came out, they, uh, there was a question that they had to be measured before they are being dispatched. I thought you might be interested to see some one or two very old photographs that I've dug out on this. Yeah. Here's me. Young Bob, right. age, 20, yeah. age 20, perhaps 21, I'm not quite sure there. And this was the, yeah, the procedure, Monday, every Monday morning, samples which had to be put into the reactor, the old samples had to be put into the reactor, the following Monday they would be taken out of the reactor, and the samples which, became, which, contained, the, which, which contained the isotopes which are radiated in the reactor are the little cans, can you see them yeah. there? Yeah, and so when, that's, that's you on the left. That's me on the left, yes. And um, Brian Longstaff, who was a Harwell man, I don't know whether you knew Brian Longstaff in, in Harwell. Well, he, he's yes. the recording where, where things are going. And in the next picture here we have, um, after bringing them out of the reactor, we used to call them piles in those days, not, yeah. by the way, not, yeah. not, not reactors. Yeah. Um, after they came out of the pile, they were highly active and they had to be immediately put into these lead trolleys which provided right. necessary shielding. And here am I holding the, um, the state-of-the-art ionisation chamber um, device, um, measuring the dose rate that's coming from the samples. And you may notice in my pocket I'm wearing the, the film badge and the electroscope which yeah. all recorded the yeah. amount of dose rate we were receiving during, during the job. And then having made the isotopes, they were then 
They then had to be dispatched to their place of order. Um, and there were a fleet of cars which carried these. There, there, are two, there are two ways of protecting yourself from radiation. One is to have heavy shielding, well that was the initial thing you saw on the, the other photograph. Heavy shielding, um, and the secondly is put as much distance between you and the radioactive source. So from the point of transport, the, um, the, the ideal arrangement was a very long vehicle, a fast one, because time, time is important for short-lived isotope. Yeah. So it's a very long vehicle uh, with some shielding and uh, some distance as well. So the, and, and the fleet of cars took them to the various hospitals in London or to the airports, whatever. Um, I was called upon to write um, a chapter in, in this book. Right. Yeah. Um, on the handling of radioactive isotopes. So that was my start of my, of my career, really. Well, the measurement was a, a sort of thing which has gone through my whole career. And it certainly started with the measurement of radioactivity from these samples. And, and the, um, um, the, there are two things here. One is the, the radioactivity of the source itself, and second is the dose rate that it produces that is received by the person yes. in, in, the, in the vicinity. And I was concerned with both aspects and for a number of years worked on the um, improving and improving methods of um, uh, methods of measuring the, this, this um, uh, uh, measuring the activity and the, and the dose rate which is produced from it. Um, I also worked on methods of measuring the neutron flux in the in the pile because in, in order to calculate how long it had to stay and you had to know the neutron flux and as this varied it needed constant measurements and this got me a ticket to a conference at the Athens at Peace conference in Paris in 1950s so that, that, that was also a first uh, uh, right, for right, me to, yeah. to, to get there. So that that was my work with 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 isotopes, and that went until the late fifties, when um, it was noticed that that I'd received very much more dose myself than I should have had in in that period. I don't know, the, can't can't tell you the figures exactly, but they they were higher than would be the other allowed now. So I'm lucky to be around, aren't I? Yeah. Um, and um, I was, I've changed over from doing this high-level radioactivity work to doing low-level radioactivity work. And um, for that, I was moved, for that work, that stage was moved to the Bonnetage Research Laboratories, at, at, which is now, now where the Grove um, establishment and it is. And um, the work there was to, to set up um, the uh, facility for actually measuring low-level tritium. Tritium is the isotope of hydrogen, and because of the nuclear weapon trials in the nineteen um, in the nineteen sixties, the level of tritium in the atmosphere went many hundred times higher than the normal level, or, or the level that has come back to today. But this provided a, a useful tracer. Of, of rainwater and some very interesting work came out of that. The first thing was it was still difficult to measure because tritium is, an, is a radioisotope which has got a rather weak beta, it's difficult to measure and there isn't much of it either. So it needed very specialised equipment to, to make it and that was my job to set up the laboratory. There's a picture, you may remember Brian Metcalf, Homo oh, people, yeah. Yeah. and Red Strong, Yes. and oh, that's me in the yeah. middle. Yeah. Oh, that was my my team that worked on the on the tritium laboratory. So this was all at the Wantage research. This was at the Wantage and in this uh, building. Right. Yeah. Because the um, because the, these were very low levels, even though they were hundred times hundreds of times more than they were normally, they were still very low levels. And if we 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 tried to set up a laboratory in with the other laboratories there. And the contamination yeah. levels were too high, we yes. couldn't do it. So we were shipped to the end of the site. The 
there was a great deal of interest in how long it took for aquifers to replenish their water. Water was being mined everywhere, being driven, holes were being bored, water had been taken out and were drying up. And the question was, why are they drying up? Why aren't they getting refilled? How long does it take them to, to refill? For a little bit of a, out of local interest is the time that water arrives in the springs at Hullwell. And, and what we found there uh, was that the, um, the movement of the water through the chalk was very much slower than was, was ever believed. And in fact, the water you get in the springs at, at Harwell will be about 20, 30 years or something, something of that order, depending on the depth of chalk at which it has to travel through before it reaches the water table. So it fell as rain on the downs 20 years or so before, before. it appears in the, yes. in the springs. Yes, yeah, yes. Which is interesting. So it's, it's good stuff, isn't it? <laughs> well, then, it, that work got ex extended because the next question was, one, the, the study of the water falling in, at Harwell it was not of the major interest at that time, but what was of major interest is the water for London. And the, uh, a part of the water supply from London came from the wells drilled in, in Slough. I, I don't recall when they were drilled, but they were artesian and went 100 feet in the air when they were first drilled. But uh, from usage over time, that's gone right, right down. And the question was, why aren't they being refilled? And we, we in our work, took samples following from the North Downs and the South Downs, which is the filling of the aquifer that's under London, and we never found tritium in any of the, po in the points. It hadn't reached our first point. And at this, po this time, we realised we needed an isotope which would give a much longer lifetime, uh, half-life, with a much longer half-life, so that we could, um, um, we'd actually plot the age at which the water was coming through. Well, to cut a long story short, this meant carbon-14, and that was our introduction to carbon-14, was for hydrology and the dating of the water that arrives at the, ho at the Horlicks factory in Slough, that's where, where, where the pump, where, the, um, where it was being pumped. And fr from setting up the carbon-14 apparatus, we deduced that it was some 20, 30,000 years old, the water there. So do you want to say a little more about carbon-14? Well, that was our introduction to carbon-14. We set up apparatus to measure carbon-14. We just got a, a much, it's got a, a 5,730 years half-life, um, which meant that, that we could trace it much further back than we could do with tritium, which is only a short, a short half-life. As I said, it was very slowly, it was good for, for, short, for short stretches of, test, but not for very long distances. Um, carbon-14, yes, well, carbon-14 we came to in the, early six, in the early 60s, and this, of course, had, we found many applications other than just the hydro hydrology, which are pretty well known. Probably the archaeological applications are the, are the best known. What's called carbon dating in... in Radiocarbon carbon, dating, yes. yes. And... Uh, we, we did um, quite a lot, we got contracts in the early days for the for, for, measure, for doing a lot of rescue the rescue archaeology in the 60s was very it was very important and a lot of samples which were sitting waiting to be measured and, and how well did those and many of those are published um, now one, one of the applications which I worked with this to was the dating of the round table, known as King Arthur's Round Table, which is housed in Winchester. Yeah. And there's a picture of a much younger me standing at the side there. Yeah. So it gives you some scale of the dimensions of this, um, of the, of this, of this table. Um, I've forgotten exactly how many samples, but it was, it was in, in around the 20s to 30s of samples that we took obviously from the back of, of the wood in different sections and supported by dendrochronology because if you date wood you have to allow for the age of the tree yeah. 
That's what I was thinking. It doesn't tell you the date the table was made, it tells you the date the tree was, yeah. Yeah. Uh, was growing. The, um, the, this ended, ended up her uh, work as a chapter in, in the book that, um, that, that was published by Martin Biddle. He doesn't exactly agree with our dates because he wants it to he wanted the result to agree with a certain historical event, a marriage, um, and then we were some 30 or 40 years later than the right. Right. result. But I'm afraid that's something which will be debated for a long time. Yeah. And did you also have some involvement in the dating of the Turin Shroud? Um, yes, yes. Uh, this was a development of the world. One, one of the problems with the early radiocarbon dating was that the, you needed large samples. Um, um, a piece of wood about the size of a matchbox would provide enough carbon for us to do the, the, the measurement. And the, the search was on for a, a method of doing it which would allow much, much smaller samples. Uh, the line we took was to make very small ionization chambers only about 10 centimetres long and one centimetre diameter, which would allow milligram samples to be measured. Uh, and we did bid the, to, to um, join in and, 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 and date the Turin Shroud. Perhaps we were lucky we didn't, get, we didn't get involved in that, because at the same time, a completely new method of measurement was being developed over the world. And Oxford, at Oxford they had got this machine, it's a million pound machine called an accelerated mass spectrometer, which enables sample to measure very milligram um, sample right. and measure it much, uh, more rapidly. Um, it's diff it, it measures the radioactive carbon, data, uh, radiocarbon content ultimately, but it does it by measuring not the number of of nuclei which which uh, which emit the radioactive particles uh, in unit time, but measures the measures the ones the the active carbon fourteen nuclei that are sitting waiting to to right. to, to de decay, and of course if you play the numbers game, there are, that that means you can you've got many many more sitting waiting that are going to be... So it's e easier to measure. So it's easier to measure, you can measure in a few minutes, whereas we needed a large sample and a very long time to, to do it. But our small counter would have enabled us to join in, but the, um, the decision was it was only to be three laboratories, and we weren't one of them in the end. I did have a couple of trips to Turin, and I've actually seen the Turin Shroud. Right. So you used carbon-14 for the round table. What other uses did it have? It, it had many, it, there were many uses and we exported them. One was environmental measurements around, the, around nuclear power, power stations. Carbon-14 was emitted from all those stations and was licensed to do it. The question was proving that the levels in the foodstuffs that are grown around it and the distance were, were, were um, of a low enough level to be inconsequential to help. And so that was, that was an application for carbon-14 there. There was waste, waste tips. Yes, this arose because of an explosion at a new reservoir um, when all the dignitaries were, uh, the, dignit the local dignitaries were invited to come and see the opening of this new underground uh, reservoir and there was a, an explosion due to, meth due to the methane that was there. The question was, where did this methane come, up, um, come from? And so the work of using carbon reporting as characterising the origins of the methane became important. Well, that started with, where did it come from? Well, that at it was modern methane that had come from the, the, the river water, the organic compound of the river water. On waste tips, where, where um, uh, which are, began to house, ordinary houses were built around these yeah. waste steps and people would find methane in their homes. People go into their electricity cupboard and smell methane because yeah. the, the pipe, the, the 
cut pipes always come out yeah. in, in, in with, the, with, the, with, the, with the pipelines there and they smell methane. The question is, whose methane is it? Has it, has it come from out of the ground naturally, from perhaps peats at a lower level, or from um, ancient um, coal mines, which um, was generated, or is it from the, the wasted, which is, not, which is not too far away, where modern material is, is, is being buried? And so characterizing this was quite an important application of carbon 14. Uh, so we've got the environmental applications, we've got the wasted applications. We're, we're, we're moving now to thinking about how to um, um, assess the amount of fossil fuels that are being built by, by local power gen generating stations. So it's a, a huge project. And there, there are many applications, I'm sure you as well. Oh, another one perhaps of interest to mention is, of course, about this time, is, is the dating of, of wines. Right. Um, fraudulent addition of, of, of chemical alcohol to wines was happening in, 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 um, in, in some ports that were being, uh, port wines that were being imported. And, and again, carbon-14 could check that absolutely because chemical, the, the, um, uh, the alcohol from the from the lab bottle is a petrochemical yeah. origin, which means it is four hundred thousand million years. The the carbon fourteen level of the grapes, were at the modern level of the air, of course, yeah. and so there's a, a very big difference between that and artificial, the um, petrochemical alcohol, which was fraudulently added over a period of some time. We. That's amazing. We still to this day get the occasional wine sample to, to test um, because the, the um, old wines labelled perhaps 1930 may not necessarily be 1930 because as well as the tritium level becoming very much enhanced by the nuclear weapon trials that we, which ended in 1963 by the way, but up to the 50s to 63, the uh, carbon-14 um, level in that also went up nearly twice its normal level right. and, uh, and so it's very clear if, if there is any mixture of the of ancient and, and modern. Right. Do you want to say anything about your, uh, your present activities before you go on and talk about the remains in the garden or...? or... Um, well, I suppose my, my work at the harbour side came to me in 1990. I'd been angling for this for quite some time to set up a private business to do, to do this, this work. Uh, I, it was a good shop window for, for, the, for the harbour authorities and we had quite a few column inches in newspapers as a result of our work with, 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 with various objects with, with the headlines. But it really wasn't a very profitable one. In the 1990s, anything that wasn't prof profitable had to go. It was, it was the time of that. It was shut down. Um, and, and, and so in 1990, I was very happy to leave, to leave Harbour and set up my own business with my colleague, uh, Jim Walker, at the time, who's been my partner in the business ever since. And we started that in 1990, thinking it might be fun. And we said, if it stops being fun, we'll stop doing it. And we're still doing it. <laughs> I think it's about 1960, we moved to Harwell from, from Didcot. Right. And uh, on the site that we still live on now, but a, a different house. But at that time, it was my first introduction to, se to septic tanks. Right. We flopped. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I thought I should do something about this. So I... I dug additional drains, and to my surprise, my surprise came across a, a skeleton, <laughs> which turned out to be an Anglo-Saxon skeleton. There's a picture there. Yeah. Um, I remember ringing the, lo the local policeman up and saying, "I think I found a skeleton in my my garden. I, I think I found a female or something which I recognised." Yeah. Um, and he said, "Oh my God." <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and 
but I then assured him that it was probably an eight, a, a, a very ancient one, and he was much happier. And we rang the um, we rang the uh, it's not the archaeology in Oxford, and they came out and did uh, they actually did the excavation. I didn't oh, do it, yeah. but here it is in the photograph, full skeleton with a, a, a dagger apparently going into his chest. Yeah. And this created great interest in the village. And um, I think for a, a matter of a week, it was in, in August, July time, and the crowds of people came from yeah. the village, you know, to come and look at the uh, skeleton. And we got, we got, we're in every newspaper, including the Daily Miller, Mirror. <laughs> and this was in your garden out here. Right. We're looking at it. You see the little dip, you see by the tree where I've cut, yeah. cut down there. Yeah. By the way, a little dip.